You know, you can't force people to engage with you that don't want to in a productive way. Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 712, with today's guest, Sensei Karen Valensic. I am Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I founded Whistlekick because I love martial arts. I love traditional martial arts, and that's why we do all the things we do. What do we do? Well, if you go to whistlekick.com, you can find out all the stuff that we do. You're going to find links to projects, products to enhance your experience, understanding, joy as a martial artist. One of the things we have, yeah, it's a store because we sell stuff and got to pay the bills somehow. But we sell some pretty cool stuff from training programs, fun apparel, functional apparel, training equipment, you name it. Well, not you name it. There's stuff we don't sell, but we sell a lot of different stuff. And you should check it out. And if you haven't checked it out recently, you should check it out again. Use the code PODCAST15. It's going to get you 15% off anything we have over there. The show, Martial Arts Radio, gets its own website. Whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. We release two brand new shows each and every week. And the goal of the show and really of Whistlekick overall, it's to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, well, there are a lot of ways you can do it. You can make a purchase. You could tell a friend about us. Maybe join the Patreon. If you think the new shows we put out are worth 63 cents a piece, well, then maybe you'll join us at the $5 a month tier. And if you do, you're going to get exclusive bonus content that you're not going to find anywhere else. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Check it out. And if you want the entire list, all the ways that you can help us out, if you're all in on what we do, Whistlekick.com slash family. I had a great time talking to Karen Valencic. Just an, an absolutely awesome conversation. And we talked about a bunch of different stuff. She's an Aikido practitioner and has taken a lot of the philosophy from her time training into some other things. And we talk about that. Now, those of you who know me well know I enjoy a good, deep, at times philosophical conversation. And that's what we had today. We're talking about training, but we're also talking about life and so much more. And I hope you enjoy it. Here we go. Sensei Karen, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. I am delighted to be here. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm, I'm happy to have you here. Sensei Karen's also my mother, by the way. Oh, <laughs> not listeners, oh, not, right? not, not the person I'm talking to, but my mother's name is Karen. She also trains. So. You know, she must be a wonderful person. I, our name has gone through some type of trouble. It has. Oh, man, yes. that's. I try not to bring it up too much, but <laughs> it's just like, you know. I wonder, I wonder how often people think of that. I thought of it when it, when I started seeing that come up, I was like, you know, that's like an actual person's name. Right. And I know plenty of people named, including my mother. Did they realize that they've just kind of ruined an entire name? Yeah. You know, I try not to put a lot of energy into it, but, it, but it is. And it's like, I really have never met a Karen that is actually like what they describe. I, most Karens I know are really fine people. <laughs> so, it, it had to be a name. It was just, a, I suppose, a random choice. And, I don't, and you and the others of your, your name ilk were cast the short straw. Well, you know, it seemed like that all started around the time that there was that Amy that was in Central Park that created that whole thing where she God, reported the man to the cops. Oh, yes, yes, she yes. Her, and, and that seems like when yeah. it all started. So I don't know why it's they didn't possible. use the name Amy. But but anyway, I mean, I guess it's it's kind of like the name Dick for a man, you know, it's but yeah, but that's yeah. been around for years. <laughs> so I don't it's know. True. It's true. It's <laughs> true. Um, not at all what you're here to talk about. Not of course, at all. we're going to talk about a bunch of things. We're going to talk about your training. We're going to talk about some book stuff and other work stuff. Sure. So let's, I, I, I like hit and rewind okay. right at the top, most, most of the time anyway. Let's do that now. So okay. um, day one, you start training. What, tell us about that day. You know. The why, the where, the when, all that. You know, I, it was a process for me. And I'll tell you, the very first time I ever heard about Aikido, and I, sh and I should tell your listeners that I am a bit of a purist. I have studied only Aikido, mm. other than I've done a little bit of Tai Chi and a little bit of Qigong, which isn't really in a martial art. But um, so I've been a traditionalist Aikidoist for 32 years. Mm. My first time I ever heard of Aikido was actually in Ram Das's book, How Can I Help? 
and it was Terry Dobson's story that you you may many people have, have heard. It was mm-hmm. called a t- kind word turneth away wrath, and it in the the story really touched me deeply. And that was a really long time ago. And um, for those of you that don't know about that story, it's, it's almost, if you're interested, you can probably Google it and find it. Um, but Terry Dobson, kind word, turn, word turn away, turneth away wrath, where he's on a train in Tokyo, and he's there over there studying Aikido. And he has a situation with a drunk man that gets on a, on a on the train and starts really throwing people around and he decides he needs to get up and defend Mm -hmm. people. And right before, you know, it's a beautiful, it's a beautifully written story that I've actually shared many times by heart, but I'm not going to do that here, but it, it shows where he was about ready to take a swing. And there was a, a little Japanese man sitting there that right before he did that said, Hey, and he, he totally deflected, the situation and and the whole thing just all shifted through no violence at all and and Terry Dobson goes on to say that you know what he had been prepared to do with muscle he heard true aikido done with a with kind words and compassion and that just really struck me about the art and i and of course back then there was no aikido here in the midwest where i am and so that's where I first heard about it and was just really intrigued with, gosh, I wish I could do that. And, and then I was, I was actually the next time that Aikido kind of came into my, my, my view was when, um, I attended a dental conference out in Colorado and Tom Crum, whom again, I don't know if, if your listeners know or not, but he, he authored the book, The Magic of Conflict. And he was an Aikidoist and he was presenting at this conference. And I have to say that his presentation changed my life. It was one of those moments where everything shifted for me. And I, I got a lot of clarity about my future. I had, at the time I was married, I had two very young children and it just totally shifted my world in a in a really positive way and actually i started i started my professional career as a engineer and i have a degree in mechanical engineering and at the time i was working for a um, automotive company delco remi and i was a product engineer and i was one of the very first women engineers there and, um, and so I decided I was going to make a huge career shift and I was going to start studying Aikido and I was going to start helping people deal with conflict. That's what I decided. And, and my whole world kind of got shook up at that point. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that wasn't the first, so it was the first time I was actually in a room with people doing some Aikido movement. And then I, I came back here from there and I was so excited and there was, there was an Aikido dojo here and it was a Yoshinkan dojo Mm -hmm. and I started training with them. And I have to say it was a, it was not a pleasant experience for me. Mm. I trained with them for about a year and I would go to, I would go to class (laughs) and I, and you know, I, I hate to say this, but I would go to class and I, I would say, I love Aikido. I hate this class. (laughs) I mean, that's how, that's how I felt about it. And then then like a year later, there was someone that had been practicing, had been teaching down at um, Indiana University, which is about an hour and a half south of me. And he came to Indianapolis and I started practicing with him. Now, mm. the first time that I think you're asking me about, he had a small group of guys and they were renting space in a gymnastics studio and I went and watched and they were doing all these high falls. And I mean, I just was so jazzed. I thought I want to be able to do that. That's Mm -hmm. what I want to do. And that's when I really started practicing and loving my practice and having really what I called teachers that were teaching uh, more in line with what I was interested in learning. And, and I think, you know, listening to some of your other podcasts, I think, you know, any art probably you can have it really depends on who's teaching it and what aspects of it they bring out. And so, so that was, yeah, that was 31 years ago. And that was, you know, my induction. And I, I, you know, I could hardly, I was a terrible dancer at the time. And I think one of the things that all my practice has done is help me be more physically coordinated. 
<laughs> I rarely fall over chairs anymore. And if I do, I can fall <laughs> easily. So, there you go. <laughs> but Get a that good was roll out of it. Yeah. So that was, that was my, um, that was my, and I was so jazzed. And then, you know, you know, tr- over all these years, I've been in different places around town, different, you know, situations, been in garages, been in basements, been in health clubs, been in churches, been, you know, in a lot of different spaces where, you know, we create a place where we can train. And so, and I've also traveled all over the country, um, training with all kinds of different people um, over the years. So, so yeah. And so, you know, what attracted me to the art is, is like I said, I really wanted to be able to, I wanted to be able to enter into difficult situations and be able to be graceful, have that power with grace. Mm-hmm. And I also, I think, was like many people really intrigued with martial arts as a human being and kind of always thought, is it possible for me to do that kind of stuff? Because, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think at this point in my life, you know, I love the fact that I can, I can still roll. I can still, and a lot of times when I'm speaking, I'll roll, roll up to the podium and, and I can do that without losing my breath or, hurting myself. And I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think that's great. Yeah. That's so, great. so yeah. And so I really, I really, um, my thing that with Aikido, I really wanted to do was to be, somehow, you know, a lot of people might study martial arts for self-defense or because they're afraid or they like the exercise. And whenever I'm teaching, I always like to ask people, what it was that attracted them to Aikido uh, because then it's always different. It's, mm. it's always different. And I think, you know, it it's goes between p- some people just want to learn how to fall down and get up. Some people want exercise and stretching kind of the aerobic aspect of it. Some people want something more spiritually oriented and, um, and some people have been practicing other arts and are tired of getting beaten up. So <laughs> So I think that's, that might be the more primary place where people come, come to practice is, is I've been doing this or that, and I I'm too old to do that anymore. I want to do something, I want to do something that's not so hard on my body. And of course, Aikido can be hard on your body as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So. Now you, you mentioned something a couple times, this idea of learning Aikido to these weren't exactly your words, but essentially diffuse conflict. Mm-hmm. And I find when, when someone's bringing up something multiple times, it suggests that the opposite was something in their lives. Was there, did you grow up with a lot of conflict? Was well, there anything that? You know, I, I grew up, you know, I grew up in a family of, of a wonderful family where my father was an engineer, my mom was a biology teacher, and I had two brothers. And we sat down together as a family every day at five o'clock. And mm, so we had a, a solid family structure. But th- was there tension? Yes. Um, was there, you know, frustration? Yes. I mean, like most middle class families, you got you kind of go through things. And 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 so I think. I kind of took on a role in my family of wanting to make everybody happy. And, and maybe that's because I was the only daughter or middle whatever. Child? I was, I was a, a middle child. I was a middle child. And, and so I was, I spent most of my life trying to make everybody happy. And of course, that's a, that's a losing battle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so, and then I, and so I, I, I can't say I had a, tra- I'm not going to say I had a traumatic upbringing. Not, I mean, I feel really grateful when I, when I know what a lot of other people have gone through. And I, but I also felt like I, uh, I think when, when you feel like you never win an argument, you know, I think mm-hmm. that's, it's like when you have a viewpoint and you can't get yourself heard. And, you know, when I actually was introduced to Aikido, I was married and and I married someone that had, was very, was older than me and also was, had incredible verbal skills. And, and I frequently, when we would disagree on things, I would frequently leave feeling just frustrated and he would think everything was fine. And then the next day I would bring it up again and he'd be like, I thought we we settled all this. And it was just like, I found, you know, even with a lot of therapy, I never felt like I could find my voice quite right. And I've, I've learned that through my practice of Aikido. You know, it's like, how do you, how do you show up and enter into relationship without losing yourself? 
And for me, that's, that's, that to me in a, in a sentence is what Aikido is, is how do I show up? How do I engage? And, and, I can, and I can bring with me what I'd like to bring with me and bring the rest of myself back. And so for me, that's what that practice is about, is really creating my own presence. And, and I, think, I think the whole aspect of, of entering Urimi it was probably my biggest area of learning is, is how do you really enter into something that's scary? And I had some fabulous teachers and practice partners that really allowed me to and encouraged me to really enter hard. And so that, yeah. And so, you know, over the years and, and, and your listeners don't know this yet, but I, I've actually written a, written a book and a second edition that I call Spiral Impact, which is all about how do you master conflict? And it's not about resolving conflict or um, managing conflict. It's really about mastering conflict because the fact is, is we're surrounded by conflict. And if we're not, yeah. um, that, that means we're, we're isolated and we're not learning. And if we're isolated, we we'll probably have conflict with ourselves. <laughs> right. you know? I, think, I, I think we all know what internal conflict feels like. Yeah, and, right. And I think sometimes those are the worst ones because you can't win. No, <laughs> you're always losing an internal conflict. <laughs> you're right. You're right. And, and, you know, and it's, it's fascinating to see what's going on in, in the world today and with, particularly with people, mm. you know, and I, I have found it's, it's just fascinating how divided we have become. And I, I really feel like, um, you know, you can't force people to engage with you that don't want to um, in a productive way, but but I have found, I, th I think these skills are more important than they've ever been in my lifetime. And, and I'm, you know, I've been around a while. <laughs> so <laughs> sadly, I don't, I don't see it going away. No, right. I don't either. I don't either. And it's not, not for a little while. Mm -hmm. I think we've got some more work to do now. Now yeah. you talked about the difference between, um, Mastering conflict, and you use two other terms, you know, just okay. using conflict, et, et cetera. Well, yeah. And, and it Maybe. sounded like that was something you've talked about before. So could you kind of break that down, what those differences look like? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, because I speak a lot to business audiences. Mm. And, and so if you were to, if you, if I were to do a Google search in terms of what, what kind of keywords do I want to have, people are typing in conflict management and conflict resolution. And, and those, and, and, you know, and for me, both of those words, particularly management implies, we got to get rid of this. Hmm. We got to get rid of this. And so, and, and I find that people tend to, um, they tend to have different choices. Some people just will do whatever they can to avoid conflict. And, you know, those are our, our, our comedies. You know, if you look at the funny shows, they're all people avoiding conflict, you know, <laughs> to disastrous and, results, usually. Right. I, most right. sitcoms it, I watch and I'm just I'm sometimes yeah. literally, but usually in my head saying, but if, if you just spent an ounce of effort communicating exactly. instead of avoiding this. Right. Or you wouldn't have this, this painfully humorous result at the end. Right. Right. And when I go into an organization, a lot of times I'll tell the leadership, you know, when you think about it, people have learned their communication and their conflict skills through usually their family. Mm -hmm. And there aren't that many functional families out there or our entertainment or our media. And there aren't very many good examples of, quite frankly, constructive conversation isn't necessarily entertaining and doesn't draw people in, but that's not really how you want to run a business or run your life. So, cause it's, it's exhausting, <laughs> so, but, but yeah, management, management is kind of like, okay. And, and it's interesting because years ago um, there was a company that hired me and I would come in quarterly and I would do these two day training programs in conflict I called it um, using conflict creatively back then, mm -hmm. and I and and it went through uh, it went through phases where people wanted to come because they knew that was part of their development, and then I went through a phase where people would send people because they wanted they felt like they needed it. So people would come, they felt like they were being punished because they had handled conflict badly. <laughs> so so it's funny how that word that word conjures up a lot for us. But but when you think about it. 
Um, and I do a program, I call it Momentum at the Corner of Conflict, Change, and Innovation. You know, those three things, conflict, change, and innovation, you don't have, you don't have one without the other two. That you, it doesn't exist. And so most people want to innovate. Um, most people want other people to change, but they resist their own change. And all, both of those things create more conflict. And the conflict is, I mean, you can see with the pandemic, how many innovations have been come forth through that conflict of the virus. So, so those three things are really, um, really intertwined. And if you don't, if you don't allow conflict, then you don't allow the innovation to come forth. And so, but it's got to be what I call innovative conflict. And most people think of destructive conflict. So, so that's, that's, that's the, that's the difference. And, and so Jeremy, we're, most people watching this are probably listening, but, but how I define conflict and and I'm going to show you, but I'm going to describe this to your listeners, our listeners. But if you take both of your fists and push them together, that tension is conflict. And what makes it creative or innovative depends on how, how hard, how fast or how long that pushes. And so what I teach people is you got to have the, you got to have that engagement to push, but you, then what you do is you spiral and Aikido is all based. A lot of it's based. Uh, on spiral. Okay. That's, that's where there, spiral there's, and there's comes where it comes from. in. Yeah. Right. And that's, oh, that's, that's where that comes from. And that's where, that's where you can start influencing and collaborating because now you've, you're moving in the same direction. And so, and that's all of Aikido is really about, how do we, how do we blend? And, and, you know, there's that rote beginning of learning to blend, but then there's the more subtle where you, you actually can help feel, you know, you can, you can feel a person's center and kind of move with that. And it's really magical when you can do that. And so in my work in, in companies, I've created a, a model, I call it spiral impact that really puts that into a form that people can practice in their work. And, and it's, it's, it's a simple, it's a simple thing. And, and when they can see that demonstrated, um, it, they really get it. I mean, people really get how the fact that being con- confrontational doesn't get them anything that they want. And at the end of the day, it's what is it that you want? Are you getting it or are you not? And, and if you're fighting for it, usually you're not, you might get it in the short term, but you don't get it in the long term. So that's my deal. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's interesting too, as a woman, and and I'm not a hefty bone, big bone woman. I'm a, I'm a um, fair boned individual, tall and kind of willowy. (laughs) So, and I, I find that for me in my Aikido practice, it's to my advantage because I cannot muscle my way through technique. Uh, I just don't have to learn learn it the right way. You couldn't. I do. I do. And I, and I am so aware of that with many of the men that I practice with that I have a, an advantage in a sense, because I, I can't force technique. I have to get it. I have to get it right. Um, And I think that's, that's, that's an advantage. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So I didn't enter the, yeah. So I did not enter my martial arts practice feeling like um, I need to be able to defend myself on the streets or, you know, I, I really came in from a, you know, I'm here, I was a, an automotive engineer and I just really wanted to be able to enter into my world and be able to have a positive impact and be able to be heard and be able to influence um, influence in a, in a way, and, you know, influence can be really manipulative actually. Um, but I wanted to be able to do that. And, and, and it's exciting to be able to be at a, a, a point in my life where I, I know how to do that and be able to voice that and show up. And, and, and I think also Aikido done well, there's a certain amount of training that comes with the empathy, because if you really want to, and, and I think there's, I think there's layers, and and I'll say, it, and I'll say, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people jump around and don't stay with something for a, long enough. And I will say that a big turning point for me in my practice came after 20 years. And I will say I practice, I've been, I've been a consistent, now the pandemic has changed things. But, sure, sure. For but, all of us. 
for all of us. But I, but you know, even then I had, I did, did online stuff. I have mats in my basement. I do rolls every day on my carpet. I mean, I'm, I'm I stay pretty active with the movement, sure. but, but it was 20 years of consistent. I'm talking three to five days a week of practicing that I had a really amazing breakthrough that just totally shifted my entire my entire experience of Aikido. And, and I it hope was, you're going to talk about that. I, I will. Okay, I will. good. Okay, good. Because that, 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 that was a beautiful setup, but I was starting to get afraid that you were just going to move on. No. I, like, no, I want to hear about this. It's the secret and I can't share it. No. <laughs> <Sad. laughs> no, I'll, I'll tell you. And, and you know, and I, 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 I should proceed this by saying, I, I'm going to tell this, I'm going to tell this story, but I have had so many wonderful people teaching me along the way. And I consider almost everyone that I've practiced with as a teacher. So, so there's been people that are senseis at the front of the mat. And there's also people that, that, that I train with. So I feel like I've, that 20 years of practice set me up to the experience of, of this one piece. But there was a teacher and he's, he's now been deceased, I think for 10 years now, which is mind blowing to me. And Kevin Schott sensei, he was from Chicago. He was one of Satomi sensei's top students. And Kevin, Kevin was, he, he, I mean, he really lived. Aikido was from my, at least from my perspective was really truly his life. And he, at that point in his life actually had started practicing Sistema and was going to Russia and and he started really taking some of those concepts and and putting them to, into his aikido training mm. and and he i went up to a seminar and it was in june and there were only a handful of people there there might have been five people in this seminar and it was such a rich experience and kevin actually he i showed up there and he usually was kind of a quiet kind of awkward kind of guy and he um he was like a changed personality. I mean, and, and it was just like I said to the guys there, I said, What what's up with Kevin? He's so friendly. <laughs> you know? And and they said, you know, he came back from Russia like a changed person. And and you know, he was really teaching in a way that was so deep. It was so deep. And I think a lot of people that practice Aikido might have thought he was just a little off, but he really was talking about structure and flow and, and really the nuances of how we're walking. And, but, but the thing, and he had us doing some of these exercises and what I really got in his thing was how little, well, not how little, how, like, I guess how little my physical movement had to do with my success in technique compared to how relaxed I was. And and he we do this thing where someone you know gra- grab do a wrist grab and then the assignment wasn't to figure out a, a way to do the wrist lock the assignment was notice where you're tense, relax where your tension is, and it's just like magic happens when you do that and it's it's like a lot of times I hold tension in my calves of all places, mm. and it was just like just really interesting because when you let go of the tension. Not only you you have a, an effect on your partner and yourself, and you can actually feel your way more through the technique than if you try to do a prescribed movement that's really gross. So it's really more that internal that internal aspect of Aikido that really um, just can make an afternoon go by. Uh, in a flash. I mean, it was just was so engrossing to me. And so I think not everybody practices Aikido that way. Not everybody values practicing Aikido that way. But for me, that is where the magic is in the practice. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's, that was a real turning point for me. And that, that was, that was, that was about 10 years ago, 12 Mm -hmm. years ago now, I guess. So, yeah. Did it change? Now, obviously, we, we could we could spend hours unpacking that, but a lot of it mm-hmm. was going to be lost without, you know, mm-hmm. physical demonstration and partner work and things like that. So absolutely, let, let's take it from a little bit more of a surface perspective. Mm-hmm. How did that 
can we call it an, an epiphany realization? Yeah, I, we could call it that. It was kind of like the first time I was introduced to it with Tom Crum. It was like okay. it was like there. It was like time stood still. It was like, oh wow, okay. I get this. We're, it was world a, shifting. It was another one. Yeah, it, for for me it was. For okay. me it was. So I would imagine on the other side of a world shifting event like that, how you practiced your Aikido must have changed, and oh. that's what I'm curious about. What were you doing different? Were you in, in your in your practice? Because it sounds like as you said, you're very disciplined, Mm -hmm. but you're not going to keep doing the same things in the same way. Right. No. What do those changes look like? No, those changes look like for me is, is actually relaxing more when I'm practicing, letting go of that precision of I've got to do it this way and, and approaching my practice more from a, um, feeling state, which is so someone, someone grabs hold of you instead of, you know, instead of thinking, oh, I need to do this technique. It's more relaxing into it and trying to connect with the other person. So it, it, so because I think essentially Aikido is not supposed to hurt people. And certainly there are people that practice that hurt people, (laughs) you know, so, but I think if, I think, you know, really masters at that, um, at, at Aikido, you're not, you're not feeling those, those yanks on your bones. You're feeling, you're feeling more of the floor dropping out. And, and so, so for me, um, whenever I practice, it's always really about that focus of, of connection and feeling the connection. And it's like, it's not just yanking somebody to get them off center, but it's really kind of connecting with them in a way that you can kind of more influence their movement than forcing it. Because I think some, sometimes, I mean, because, you know, you could do a, you know, a cross, you know, um, we call it yoke Manucci, which is a, you know, a, a, a attack to the side of the head. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I can flow with that. But at some point, I've got to have a connection with my partner. And a lot of, a lot of times it's easy just to throw them, but Mm. this, I want, I want my partners to feel like instead of feeling thrown, feel like they've just, they've just been dropped gently. Mm. That's that, that becomes my, that becomes my goal. And, and, and so, yeah, and it's, it's just, it's, it's, there's no end to um, the joy. I think that comes from practicing like that. It's just, it's so much more fun than, than um, drilling down in technique. Technique is so important. And I don't mean to discount that. You kind of got to, ha- and that's why I think it's important to stay with something a long time because, you know, I could never have gotten to where I was had I not put in the time before. And so, so how do you, you know, how do you get there? And I, I also personally believe that, um, and I practice, you know, I practice meditation and breathing. Um, when I'm not practicing Aikido, I mean, I think those are things a lot of times people want to show up and be able to do, you know, all these things, but it really requires that, that pr- everyday practice of, of being present with yourself. So I think those are all really important parts of, of the practice that, yeah. that not all dojos spend time with. And most of the dojos I've had ongoing practice with don't tend to spend a lot of time focusing the, on those particular specific things. Yeah. But, but I have, um, you know, my, my initial, um, my initial work with Tom Crum, he was very big into breathing and, and meditation. And we would start all his classes with 20 minutes of breathing, Masogi breathing and 20 minutes of meditation. Oh. And, and, you know, that puts you in a really fine place to begin. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, one of the things you're talking about with with um, what I'm what I'm hearing these aren't your words but I'm hearing partnership. You know, yeah. when you are training with someone, when you are defending yourself, it's mm-hmm. partnership. And the more that you try to create space. There's almost this paradox because, you know, in martial arts, we're generally taught when we, when we think about self-defense, when you can run away. Right, right. But up until that point, in a lot of settings, I'm not even going to say, say most or many, but well, I'm not going to say most, I'm certainly not saying all, but a bunch, 
you're at greater risk when that person is farther away. You've likely had far more experiences than I have, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about here, where you're working with someone who is just so good, their eyes can be closed. It doesn't matter what you do, you know, they know where you're moving before you do. Right. Right. And so most of us are, are somewhere along that path, but we're not good enough to, to react instantly. Yet, if we can close that distance, if we can have less time for the other person, if we can have more hands on them, yeah. we get a better understanding. In, in grappling work, this is often discussed as, yeah. you know, when you're attacking, you're trying to create space. When you're defending, you're trying to reduce space. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I don't come from a grappling background. I don't come from an Aikido background, though I've, I've dabbled, mm-hmm. you know, tiny bits in both. I'm more of a stand-up karate guy, taekwondo mm-hmm. guy. But the same principles apply there. That mm-hmm. if your opponent's all the way out there, are they kicking? Are they punching? Are they running at you? Are they picking up a brick? And yet if they're right there in front of me, yeah, it's scary. Yeah. But they have far fewer options and I'm actually safer. Exactly. Well, it's that old saying of of keep your friends mm. close, but keep your enemies closer. Right. We well, you know very, and, very and, eloquent there, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I think I wrote a blog about this a long time ago, but I have two daughters and they were both in Boston for a while going to school. And we were, we were, and this to me illustrates the point. We were, we were out downtown and we were coming back to the suburbs where they lived. And um, we were on the green line. Anyone that knows Boston? Mm -hmm. Well, the green line sometimes just stops and just says, trains out of commission. (laughs) And you just get out wherever you are. And so we were in that situation and we got out and it was dark and we were, we were going to just walk back to where we were. And it was interesting because there were some CD kind of bars around the corner there. And then we kind of were walking up a hill and CD CD bars in the outskirts of Boston. (laughs) I went to school in Worcester. Oh, did you? (laughs) CD bar. (laughs) And, you know, so here I am, uh, my daughters are there and here, you know, they're in their twenties and I'm, you know, their mom and I'm, so and there's a, a man starts following us. And, and so I am, I'm thinking, okay, wh- wh- here we are. And my, you could feel, I could feel my daughter's tense. And I thought, okay, so they think their mom is going to protect them. <laughs> because I'm a martial artist, right? And I'm thinking, oh, so, but you know what I did is I applied exactly what I teach and exactly what we're talking about is I relaxed. I, 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 I literally turned around and I walked with this man and I talked to him and I asked him if he was from around here and he wasn't really interested in the conversation, but I made a choice rather than being fearful and contracted I, I just turned around and I asked, you know, I started asking him questions about where we were and, and then he just kind of went off to the side and I don't know that he was a real threat, but he, but it, but, but it was, you know, what, what do you do in that circumstance? And that's what I chose to do. You you stop um, presenting yourself as a potential victim. You, because what victim is going to have the confidence to do that? Yeah, exactly. 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 You weren't the easy target. Whether, no. whether or not it was actually going to happen, you s- seems like right. a sensible action to me. Yeah, it seems sensible to me. It worked. I mean, I, I mean, whatever. Who knows? You never know what the other things were because you didn't experience them. But, but that's, but exactly that. It's about it's about clo- it's about getting closing the space, closing the space. So yeah, exactly. And that's kind of scary. And that's when I was talking yeah. earlier about learning how to arimi. You know, and it's, 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 you know, Remy is entering in an Aikido, it, in an Aikido term. And so that's partly is part of a Remy is punching, mm-hmm. you know, coming in, but it's also moving into, to a punch and, and moving in and with it. And, and that's a scary place to be. But like you said, if you're, you know, if you're not in the same area, you're safe. But if you're, if you're at swinging distance, you're really vulnerable from that standpoint. So, Yeah. Yeah. So now I, I find that anytime someone is drawing correlations between martial arts and something else, 
right? Like for you, we're talking about Aikido and conflict. Mm -hmm. And you've certainly brought Aikido into your philosophies on conflict. Mm -hmm. But it's likely a two-way street. What is coming from writing and lecturing and understanding of conflict in these corporate and other worlds that's coming back to inform your Aikido practice and understanding? Oh, yeah. You know, what I, what I so realize is that there's, there's really an importance to the somatic method of learning, which is, mm. which what I mean is involving the, the body and the breath and the, not just the, you know, a lot of times in corporations, we want to just have a formula that we can put into place that if this happens, you do this. And it's all very cognitive. And the fact is, is that we're, you know, we're very emotional, um, emotional, spiritual, physical beings. And we, Mm -hmm. we bring all that to work. And, and I think for me, the practice is always around trying to stay fluid and keeping my, you know, keeping, keeping my options open. What did Darwin said, the, the, it wasn't the strongest that survives. It's the, it's the, the most adaptable that survives. And so, and I think, you know, in this environment that we're in now, it's it's the people adapting to all the changes are the people that survive. It's not necessarily what we call traditionally the strongest. So, um, yeah, I mean, so dinosaurs are dead, but um, <laughs> but as far as we know, <laughs> yeah, as far as we know, as far as we know. <laughs> Yeah. So did I answer your question? You wanted to know how I bring my work stuff brings me back to my practice. Well, I always get inspired when I'm practicing. I always do. And if I've got some kind of, and because I, I say master conflict, I don't mean that I get it perfect all the time. I, I'm continually practicing myself. And I, I love what George Leonard said when he said, mastery, mas- the, the true master is not, it's not perfection. Mm-hmm. It's the true master tries and fails and tries and fails again, and they stay in the game. And that's how I define master conflict. So I, and and I have to say that, you know, I don't, I don't always get it right, but when I recognize where I've gone off, I always will come back and take on my part of whatever it was that happened. And, and I'm totally willing to do that. And sometimes it takes me being on the mat practicing to work through my own stuff. So, yeah, so I, I think for me, um, the practice has really saved my life in so many ways because <laughs> I don't That's know how else thing. I process it. I mean, it really has. And, and, you know, I, I've got one, one woman that's practiced with us for a long time and she read my first book and she said, you know, I never thought about how to apply this to regular life. And I think that's something that happens with a lot of people that are in martial arts is, is thinking, how do you apply this in everyday life? You know, it, it, it ends when they walk out, when they bow off the mats, you know, they, they, yeah. they put it all down, which, you know, I, I haven't read everything O sensei wrote, but I feel like I've read enough to know that, you know, he'd be shaking his head hearing someone say that. Cause it seemed like that was the whole point. Right. Right. That's, that's what I've taken from my practice. And, and again, people teach and people practice for different reasons and none of them are wrong. They're just different. And so for me, it's really a practice of my own self-development. Plus I love the movement. I, I love the fact that, you know, I can, I can get up and off the ground easily. I love the, you know, just the connection with people. Mm. Um, I love figuring it out, you know, as a mechanical engineer, I um, I guess we could talk about, you know, beginning Aikido is a lot like Newtonian physics. There's, you know, it's vectors, you know, yeah. it's, it really is. And I think at some point, and perhaps at that 20 year mark for me, it becomes more quantum physics where you're mm. working with something that's a little bit more nuanced and dependent on other things. And it's not so much force following force blindly it's it's being a little bit more cognizant than that so i I like that analogy because i've certainly worked with amazing martial artists who seemed like they were in two places at once it's like Mm -hmm. you were just here how are you also there yeah right right exactly exactly so i think yeah and i've always i've always thought 
and I haven't said this for a while, but see, to me, when people say, well, is Aikido a defensive art? You know, my, my thing is, it's an art of self-development. And really that development to me is that I develop myself enough that I don't, pro- I don't prompt an attack. You know, that, that I, I become that person in the room that's not prompting attack. Um, and, and so I, and that, I guess that takes my, um, place in my family to another level <laughs> of the peacekeeper this way, in this way, I wouldn't be baking cookies to make everybody happy. <laughs> I'm just being showing up and being present. So, yeah. 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 So absolutely. Um, I'm curious that situation with your daughters, with the man, did they feel any inspiration to, cause you haven't mentioned if they trained, but I'm getting the sense that they don't, did that, yeah give them any inspiration? No. (laughs) You know, I guess that's, that's the thing with children. You know, I think both of my kids, we practiced a little bit as they were growing up and they certainly know how important it is to me. They really understand my concept of spiral impact. They get that. And my, my one daughter is actually a public defense attorney and she, she will say, Hey, I spiral impact that. And I, I said, good for you, you know, because at the end of the day, it's being able to apply that to your everyday life is, is what's really, really, really important. It's, um, but no, my, my kids did not become Aikido practitioners and, you know, I guess, what do you do? You, you have Leave them out of the will? I'm not sure. No. <laughs> Well, just hope that they find their own path. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not a path for everybody. Um, it, yeah, it's not a path for everybody. Although, you know, I, I think that there's so much to learn. And I and I do know when I speak at conferences and stuff that the, that Aikido demonstration is so eye-opening for people. And, and when you get the fact that, you know, it's it's the movement, it's it's not going head to head, it's it's moving in and with mm-hmm. that that gives you more more ability to collaborate and influence and not fight is, and that's where power is. You know, I talk about that, the difference between power and force. Force is a punch. Power is a rotation. Mm. And, you know, we're, we're, you know, in a a world that's fairly happy to be punching people. (laughs) Actually, I've been thinking a lot of that whole Will Smith slap. And and I think I might be doing a live stream to talk about that a little bit, but That was, um, you know, that was a, I think, a, um, I think it was an outpicturing of what a lot of people feel in the world right now is it just like to go slap someone. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> <You know? laughs> if, if that had happened 10 years ago, I don't think there would be, there would have been much debate about it. I think it would have been a, a very simple assessment from most people. This is a man who has more than, 99 point whatever percent of the world seemingly has a storybook life and ignored a lesson that we were all taught in preschool. Right. Right. But I think you're right that so many of us are so frustrated. We don't have the capacity to process Mm -hmm. that. We, we cheer that on. We, project our own desires to yeah. slap everyone around us. Well, yeah, because it's because it seems like a simple solution. You know, it seems fast, but it's the the repercussions, as Will Smith knows, are huge mm. when you do something like that. But you know, I think, you know, I also think that there's a lot of people that may not be physically slapping somebody, but they are with their words. In, in other ways in our culture. And, it, and is that, is what, how, how is that, how, how do we accept that really? I, I, I mean, wish I had a, an answer. Words other- are harder to defend. Yeah. I can't yeah. just step out of range. I can't close the distance. I can't spiral words. I can, yep. I really have one, two, two choices. One's to plug my ears and the others to yeah. try to not let it bother me. 
Yeah. And particularly if it's coming from where you, you're you not in the same room or on the same phone or on the same Zoom call. It's when it's, it's just out there. So, um, yeah. Yeah, because there are ways. I mean, and that's what I teach because, you know, in business, rarely do people punch each other, um, at least with the groups I work rarely, with. Rarely, yes. That's that's more of a rarity. We've, we've heard stories on this show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not unseen, but, you know, I mean, I, I work with a lot of, of teams that are, have done a lot of work in healthcare mm. and, you know, people can get pretty frustrated, but they don't tend to hit each other, although that does happen, but that's not really why I'm there no, I'm or they're around when they're just all, you know, frustrated and angry and, and then things get passive aggressive and aren't dealt with directly or, or not dealt with in a way that really brings everybody forth. So, yeah. So let, let's have a bit of a commercial here. You know, tell us about your book. Tell us about your speaking. You know, okay. there may be some folks listening to this who are interested in your book. They want to know where to get it. There may be some folks who say, you know, I'm responsible for bringing in a speaker for this, whatever, for this event. Yeah. She sounds great. How do they contact you? Take it away. Okay. Okay. okay so my book is called Spiral Impact. And that can be, and I recent, I wrote the original in 2007 and I actually on, on March the 17th, 2020, I released the second edition, which I call the black belt edition. And it's a black Good timing, belt. by the way. Yeah, I know it was the, you know, it got bestseller in eight categories. Nice. So I was really pleased it was with great that. Timing, then. Yeah, it it did. It it worked out, but it was just bizarre that it all happened on the same day because that was the day, the first day of lockdown here where I am. And so that book is available anywhere that you get books. It's available in hardback, paperback, and Kindle. And it's and and that book is really I um it's really a guidebook and I mm. have a nice combination. I I start every chapter out with connecting the content to my Aikido practice. And then I, I bring in some concepts that are applicable in terms of how do you do that. And, and then I have some short, short stories that are of people that I've worked with and how they applied it or didn't apply it. And, and so it's, a, it's an easy read and, um, and wanting always to be a very practical thing. And, and so that's available anywhere that you buy books. And my website, which is Karen, my website, you can go to spiralimpact.com, which is very much easier to spell than my name, yes. karenvalensic.com. They go to the same place. And I have, you know, I have content there. I have, you know, stuff I do, cons you know, I do consulting, I do speaking, I do coaching and um, I, you know, all of that type of thing. And I, I love, um, I love speaking with groups because I'll, I'll come in, kick off a conference and, you know, it's not your typical sit there and listen to somebody. It's, you know, I get people up. I usually invite somebody to, out of the audience to come take a swing at me. And we talk about, well, what do you do? <laughs> so, so a lot of times my work is, is talked about later on in the, um, in the, in the conference, because everybody can relate to it. And it's like, you know, you just did what, what Norm did to Karen or whatever. So it's, you know, it out pictures what, mm. I guess it's a little bit like when I say Will Smith, the slap, you know, it out pictured what people are, are thinking in their world. And so, so, so anyway, so I do that. And so my website is probably the easiest place to get a hold of me. Um, I have contact information there, but it's also Karen at Spiral Impact or Karen at KarenValensic.com. And I'm on LinkedIn and I'm also on Twitter, although I don't do much on Twitter. So, but you're yeah, around. Yeah, I'm Doesn't around. Sound like you're hard to find. No, and of course, you, yeah. we're, we'll we'll have all this stuff in the show notes too. Yeah, yeah, I'm not hard to find and. Always happy. I've got a thing on my website. If you want to schedule a time to talk, I'm I'm always happy to talk with people about what they've got going on. So, um, so yeah, that's it. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, thank thanks for being here. This was yeah. Great. Yeah. And you know, you you checked all my my end boxes with that question, so that's why I seem a a, a little bit oh. out of sorts. Normally, I'd say okay, and, and 
and then we do this, but you, you, you did all that. So, yeah. um, so we just have one more thing before we, we, we stop today. And that is, how do you want to leave it? What are your final words to the folks listening? Yeah. Well, being a martial arts um, podcast, I, I really want to just invite your listeners to think about their practice mm-hmm. if they're practicing and if they're not practicing, maybe you think the same thing in terms of how is your practice helping you grow? And, and, and how can you actually deepen your practice or how, how committed are you to it? Because I think, I think those are all things that are so, so very important. And like I said, I got my biggest aha 20 years in, and I, I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. So I I guess that would be how I would, I would leave it. And also just to recognize, how do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with conflict? Or do you are, are you use, trying to use force with it? Do you know the subtleties of how to spiral with it? And and you know, in a nutshell, and I'll leave you the the five the five keys to spiral impacting that are thirty thousand foot. And those are first recognize when you've got conflict, and then choose one of the following four. Turn your statements you're making about it to questions and or acknowledgements, or both, get centered. Think about what your intention is. And that's the thing that most people forget about with conflict is what's their intent. And the fourth thing is support. How do you support yourself? Who's your support system? What are you reading? What is, is it helping you? What, you know, all those things. And so that's how I teach people how to spiral impact and bring that martial aspect to their life so they have power with grace. Like I said at the top, awesome conversation, philosophical. We're talking about so many different things. And I just, I, I, I love these stories where people find martial arts and then martial arts changes their entire worldview. And that's what I heard. So Sensei Karen, thanks for coming on. I had a great time. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. I appreciate it. Head to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for all the show notes. That's where you're going to find videos, links, social media, pictures, and more. Not just for this episode, but for every single one we've ever done. If you're down to support us in all the work that we do, remember, you have lots of options. You could share an episode. You could leave a review. You could tell a friend or maybe contribute to our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And you know, I'd, I'd love to visit your school teach a seminar. Can we make that happen? If you're up for having me, just let me know. We'll, we'll find a way. We'll make that work. Don't forget the code podcast15 gets you 15% off at whistlekick.com. And if you've got topic or guest suggestions, or you want to reach out about a seminar, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.